Okay, so first I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this Rail Pacific webinar on deepening capacity to design, deliver, and evaluate high quality professional learning. I'm Kirsten Miller. I'm a communications manager at Rail Pacific and I'll be one of your facilitators today. I'm joined by my colleagues Kanoa Ishihara, Megan Taylor, and Natasha Saibua, and our panelists, Mr. Pressler Martin from the Pompeii Department of Education and Ms. Betty Segra from the Koshrai Department of Education. Um, we already um, talked about that initial technical glitch where some of you are coming in under the incorrect name. Um, in addition to that, we're asking everyone to stay muted to avoid background noise and any feedback, um, but you can use the chat feature to ask questions, which we'll address during our question and answer session. When you do post in that chat, please make sure to send to all panelists and attendees, and that'll allow others to see your questions and comments for a more interactive chat conversation. Um, any other technical questions once we once we wrap up that name issue, please reach out to Kanoa in the chat. Uh, we are recording the session. We'll share the recording and slides with you along with the survey. So look for a follow-up email from us. Um, we, don't, we do only have a short time together today, so I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a bit about Rail Pacific and our work in case you're not familiar with us yet. Um, so Rail Pacific is one of 10 regional educational laboratories or RELs that are funded by the Institute of Education Sciences or IES. So on this slide that you're looking at now, um, that map illustrates all 10 of those regions. And on the next slide, we'll provide some information about the Rail Pacific region. So as you can see, the Rail Pacific region is very geographically vast. It serves educators in the state of Hawaii, three U.S. territories, um, American, Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, and then three independent nations in free association with the U.S., and that's the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, which includes Koshrai, Pompeii, Chuk, and Yap, and the Republic of Palau. And so within these jurisdictions, we work with research practice partnerships, which focus on several distinct priority areas, and those are college and career readiness and success, uh, professional learning, which is what we're discussing today, which is really about collaborating with teachers and system leaders to create a professional learning environment in which teacher development is both welcomed and in which it works. And then language and literacy, uh, social and emotional learning, and data use and readiness. So on, on this next slide, I will just quickly go through our objectives. Um, so our objectives today are to share how the Federated States of Micronesia Partnership for the Improvement of Teaching is working to deepen their capacity to design, deliver, and evaluate high quality professional learning in Yap, Pompeii, and Koshrai, including during a recent series of principal activities. And then we're really going to dig into that research base and talk about the content that we've shared um, and that we've worked on. Um, with, with these stakeholders. Um, and then this part is my favorite part. We'll participate in a panel discussion with um, Pressler and Betty about how the partnership work and the academies are supporting principals in the FSM in creating professional learning plans for their schools. Um, on the next slide, you see the agenda. Um, we are just wrapping up our welcome and overview and introductions. And then we'll go into that overview of the partnership and the academies um, before we talk about the training topics, the research base, and move into the panel discussion. And then questions and answers, um, summary, and wrap up. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Megan Taylor. Hey, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you all today. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Um, I get to share with you folks um, an overview of kind of how this project and this partnership began. Um, and in order for you to understand kind of the process of where we took it. So like many schools, all schools across the United States, schools in the FSM must go through the process of accreditation. Um, based on those results, principals um, showed that they needed support in two specific areas, standard two, which is teacher performance, and standard three, which was data use. The professional learning projects in the FSM started to meet this need and to really help to grow principals as instructional leaders to be able to use data to make decisions about how to support teachers. So in this partnership in the FSM, we had two goals that were based on this data that was received. The first um, was a focus on designing better system supports for teacher preparation, induction, retention, and instruction. Obviously, the idea here is how do we help build capacity of principals 
to support teachers, whether it's before they enter the classroom while, or while they're there, or really supporting them to keep them involved and, and engaged and effective as, instruction, uh, as they instruct students. The second goal was to really help provide, we wanted to provide that professional learning support to our partnership members focused on using data to inform their designs for professional learning opportunities for teachers. These two goals specifically were meant to help build the capacity, like I said, of our partners based on that data that we received. Um, so the goal of the Principals Academy is then uh, were, were to develop principals as instructional leaders and to support them in developing high quality professional learning for all educators, thereby ensuring that we improve student outcomes. And I wanna take a second to really focus on this goal, right? This goal, our purpose and who we were working with were the principals, but our goal was really, again, develop them as instructional leaders, help them to learn to use data to support teachers that improves instruction, thereby ensuring that student outcomes happen. So not just that we were gonna teach something and then just hope it worked, but that we wanted to see these things impact um, all the way down to students. And so because of these things, we, we made some decisions about um, the, the training topics that we would be teaching on um, over the few years that we've been working within this partnership. And this list that you're gonna see here is a list of the training topics that we reviewed. Um, we started with um, discussing monitoring for implementation and then moved all the way down. You can see over the years that we were working in this partnership, worked all the way down to getting to a point where we were focused on best practices for developing professional learning. And so I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Natasha, who's gonna um, start talking a little bit more deeply about the things that we discussed in each of these training topics and their focus. Thank you, Megan. As Megan mentioned, the first topic we focused on in the Principals Academy was monitoring for implementation. Uh, following up on conversations with principals, about implementing school initiatives with an eye to meeting national accreditation standards. Next slide. Oh, thank you. In our conversation with leaders, we asked them to think about how they would be monitoring. So what is their plan? Um, and as they develop that plan, some of the considerations to keep in mind. Uh, first, defining and clarifying what they would be monitoring. And then we presented uh, the QFIC model, thinking about quality of implementation, fidelity to an agreed upon standard, and the intensity and consistency of the monitoring process. They could use these elements to create their plans for monitoring implementation, and then decide with their staff what to do with the information or data they collected, how it would inform professional learning, um, the, the teacher support that they were creating and building, and how they would share relevant data with their staff. Next slide, please. We reviewed a range of research-based activities that leaders could use to monitor implementation of the school initiative. For example, we talked about learning walks, classroom walkthroughs, classroom observations, reviewed lesson plans, which I'll talk about in more depth later, and also reviewing student assessment data. Much of this data we knew would require uh, a plan or a plan of action to develop and think about how they would use the data to continue. So the next thing that we focused on was a data-driven decision-making process. Now, as I mentioned, the process of monitoring required principals to look at all kinds of data all the time, and they needed a plan or system to collect, analyze, and ultimately inform the next steps. So as Megan shared earlier, we reviewed the data-driven decision-making process. Drawing from several research the research sources, we discussed this process at great length, which consisted of four steps. Step one, collecting and organizing the data. Important to start with a focus question, something that would guide their data collection. Um, and just considering what data do they already have access to and what data do they need. After that, step two, after they've collected the data, conducting data analysis. Stepping back and making observations about the data, 
what do, what, what do the data reveal? What kind of strengths, what concerns? Step three, we talked about moving into data interpretation, taking all of the observations, summarizing, prioritizing problems that have been revealed and generating possible explanations and contributing factors. And especially with these key contributing factors, um, we discussed using informal cause and effect analysis procedures for each cause or explanation statement, ask yourselves, ask them why and follow up with because three times in a row. These are some of the things that we, we did during our academies. Finally, step four, using the data to inform their plan of action. Um, in the context of the principal's academies, we focused on data collected on school initiatives, how that might inform professional learnings, how it might inform next steps in monitoring implementation and setting SMART goals. So the data-driven decision-making process was one that it was an important tool we visited fairly regularly. And that provided a touchstone as we provided, as we proceeded into more specific areas of interest. Uh, for example, quality questioning and lesson planning. These school initiatives were important because of how much evidence principals collect for accreditation and how much that evidence drew from these two initiatives. The focus on quality questions as a school initiative was prompted by opportunities to help students become independent thinkers and make connections between course content and their own lived experience. Uh, questions that allow, student, allow teachers to monitor and assess student understanding um, and to make sure that the goal was to embed quality questions as a key element of lesson plan. We talked about four elements of a quality question, questions that prompt students to think across a range of levels, questions that match the teacher's instructional purpose, questions that are aligned to the learning objectives and standards, and finally, questions that promote interactions between students. If teachers are going to use this strategy many times a day, we wanted, them to, wanted to make sure that they were using these effectively. And so from focusing on quality questions, we moved deeper into the topic of lesson plans, both short and long-term. We knew from exam examining the accreditation manuals that lesson plans hold much of the evidence that principals gather. They are used for evidence of uh, the Federated States of Micronesia accreditation standards, number one, focused on leadership, standard two, focused on teacher performance, and standard three, focused on the national curriculum standards, benchmarks, and student outcomes. So we examined several aspects for improving lesson planning, um, distinguishing between what is taught and how it's taught. We also shared some of the research on collaborative or group lesson planning. And finally, we discussed how teacher pedagogy might inform planning, instruction, and reflection, and how those things are sort of iterative or recursive. There was a lot of interest in considering the benefits of both long and short-term lesson plans. So we discussed best practices for long-term planning and shared examples and strategies. So long-term plans, we talked about expand the whole, span the entire school year, begin with national standards and benchmarks, include important school dates, show how content is integrated and related, connect the cross weeks of instruction, include high level unit information and common assessments and are created or updated every summer and in collaboration with other teachers from the same grade or subjects. On the other hand, or not on the other hand, once you've established sort of your long range planning, you can get down to the details. And so we talked about um, transitioning from long range to short, short range goals, um, backwards planning to help teachers develop short term lesson plans. Best practices for short-term lesson plans uh, include several of the same elements as long-term planning, as you can see from the list, and also specific information on how concepts will be taught and just greater frequency of creation of these lesson plans, usually weekly. Next slide, please. Finally, we discussed how to onboard new teachers into the work of creating lesson plans and shared strategies drawn from the literature, such as providing reference manuals, offering time and support through professional development, and most of all, offering opportunities to collaborate with each other. This informed the focus of the following topic, collaboration through learning communities. Next slide, please. We focused on learning communities defined as follows. Learning community is a group of educators that meets regularly, shares expertise, and works collaboratively 
to improve their teaching skills and their students' academic performance. We shared findings from research on effective learning communities, such as um, learning communities are data-driven to help improve individual practice, individual teacher practice. Learning communities are focused on high quality instruction through collaboration, and they're focused on results, um, looking at common assessments. Ideally, learning communities provide time and space for teachers to meet and talk about their own work, about student work, and for teachers to look at student performance data and divide, identify trends, and to discuss relevant literature and research and ways to apply that to their practice. We shared several considerations for principals to, discuss, to consider if they were thinking about learning communities, ideally to understand how much work it takes to develop a collaborative culture, that it's not just about encouraging their staff to work together, they would need to create a structure for that. They would need to create a structure for learning communities, build in build the time in for the workday and during the school year. Also ensure that their teams are focused, provide teams with timely, user-friendly and relevant data so that they could assess the impact of their improvement strategies. And finally, celebrate pro progress. So now I'll turn it over to Megan who will continue sharing topics that were covered in the Principals Academies. Thank you. So hopefully you guys can see the progression of the topics that we, we discussed with principals over, over the last few years. Natasha so um, expertly explained how, we, how and why we, we followed the path that we did. And once we got to that point when we were talking about um, collaboration and learning communities, the next step was really to discuss what high quality professional learning looks like and why it's important. And so we took our next discussions to comparing and contrasting the difference between professional learning and professional development. And for those of you that, that might be new to this idea, although these two terms are often used um, as if they mean the same thing, there's some really big basic differences in professional development and professional learning. And so we tried to help participants really understand these differences. Professional learning is different than professional development because where professional development might be workshop seminars or lectures, Professional learning um, includes varied opportunities to both gain information and to practice and get feedback. So this isn't a one and done opportunity where somebody comes in and they just hear about something once and then what happens after that, um, nobody knows. But where there's an opportunity for them to really take any research that's learned or strategies that are shared and to apply and practice and then come back and get feedback and coaching. Professional development is very passive. Um, whereas in professional learning, it's active and focused on results and application. Professional development is also seen as something done to teachers, whereas professional learning is planned with participants in mind based on their needs. And Tasha, like I said, did a great job explaining how we meander down this path based on what we saw, not only from the beginning data, but as we progressed through this partnership. And then of course, professional development is short-term, whereas professional learning is long-term and it happens over a longer period of time. So in these discussions then, we discussed what research suggests professional learning can do for teachers. Um, and we discuss how professional learning, high quality professional learning increases teachers' knowledge, supports their ability to improve practice, helps teachers um, better engage diverse learners, and simplify and explain many things that teachers are thinking about and talking about, ultimately, so that this professional learning can influence student achievement. And I wanna stop here and really point out that one of the things that we did during with our partnership was model this strategy. You can, you, from this conversation, hopefully you can see, this is why this partnership and, pro and project lasted so long. We modeled all of these opportunities where we did a training session and then principals had an opportunity to go back and then we came back and did coaching sessions with them and worked with them so that they could see a model of how then they could take that 
and use that for professional learning in their schools. So obviously, the next uh, step to the conversation then was how principals make professional learning meaningful for their teachers. And to do that, we talked about, again, we took it back to this conversation about learning communities and how learning communities are just a form of professional learning. They give teachers opportunities to form job and to do job embedded professional development so that they can talk, they can share their goals, they can share experiences, they share their knowledge, and together they improve their craft. Together they develop lesson plans, together they discuss the best instructional strategies to use. Um, we spent a lot of time during this conversation talking about how um, new teachers particularly benefit from learning communities because as they are new to the classroom, they struggle to know maybe what instructional strategy really helps students learn a concept, or perhaps they don't know the things that really trip students up or confuse them in a concept, or perhaps they don't know that um, within a specific SLO, you really want to break that up into two or three lessons so that students can really comprehend one piece of that and then another and then another. And so during these conversations with our principals, we really spent time discussing um, the importance of developing good professional learning and meaningful professional learning opportunities for teachers and what that could look like as, as far as how supportive learning communities would be. Um, following then, oh, sorry, um, the next, within this conversation then, we discussed uh, five steps for connecting professional learning to learning communities. We don't want to just say, speak about them as if they're distinct things. We wanted participants to understand that learning communities support professional learning. And so um, these were five steps that we discussed with participants, debriefing classroom practice, defining goals, exploring new practices, um, experimenting with learning strategies, and then this final step, reflecting and implementing. We, we talk often about adult learners and how as adults, we don't learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on an experience. And so during this conversation about how professional learning and learning communities support each other, we discussed the importance of reflecting and time to try something, reflect on it, and then really discuss with other people how it works and then how we can improve from there. Finally, uh, the culmination of this, this entire thing was discussions about best practices for developing professional learning. We've talked about all these things. So now principles, what are those best practices for developing professional learning? And during, during these discussions, we talked about some five really basic things that, that um, principals needed to consider as they started to develop their own professional learning plans. Um, we, we discussed first this idea of time, that it takes at least 15 hours on a topic in order for teachers to really try, reflect, improve, and try again. Now that doesn't mean 15 hours in a professional learning session being trained. Like I just said, this would be taking it back to their classrooms, implementing the strategy in their lesson plans, trying it, reflecting in learning communities and coming back. Maybe they're reading about a topic. Maybe they're watching videos of other people do it. All of this to try to improve. Um, we discussed the second best practice would be to ensure that sessions are well organized and purposefully developed. We wanted to make sure that principals understood that you can't just cherry pick oh, I see this and I see this and I see this, but that they need to organize their sessions and develop them purposefully, which is why having a year long professional learning plan was something that we discussed with principals. Um, the third thing, the third step would be to focus on implementation of research-based strategies. And I think that speaks for itself. We wanted principals to be looking for research-based strategies and to be focused on monitoring for implementation. Again, bringing us full circle to where we started. 
We encourage principals to provide active learning experiences, opportunities, like I said, for teachers to try things, to adapt practices for their classroom, to come back and reflect and work on them again. And finally, to include structured and sustained follow-up. And if you think back to that conversation about the difference between professional learning and professional development, this is a big one. We don't just teach something and drop it. We teach something and then build on it and build on it. And we make sure we follow up with coaching and support. As, as the projects ended in the FSM and we brought, we brought all of this together, we really took it back to one of our, our very one of our very first conversations with principals about the data driven decision making and making process and you can see that that outer circle is the steps that Natasha shared earlier uh, um, in that data driven decision making process and we really tried to help principals understand that their improvement plans their accreditation their standards their curriculum that's always going to be at the center of their work but as they start to develop professional learning plans, then where do these things fall in? They should, if they're going to be making plans based on things like Bloom's taxonomy or questioning strategies or lesson planning or behavior management for their, for their schools, this is step one. They should be basing the decisions about what they're going to do and why on data. Then of course, throughout the year, they're gonna be collecting, analyzing, interpreting that data, and then using that to make an action plan, which would be their professional learning plan. But then this is cyclical. We go back to, if they've decided on behavior management, they need to continue to collect data and analyze as the year goes on. So that was how we culminated this entire, the, the um, practices that we shared during um, this, this process and this partnership in order to help principals really put together from where we started all the way to the end. Um, and so that, that opens up, uh, we move into our next section, which is Kirsten's favorite part, um, which is the panel discussion where we, we are so thrilled to have um, Betty and Pressler here with us um, in order to discuss from their perspectives, um, things that they learned and saw during this project. Just to thank you, Megan and Natasha, and thank you, um, Pressler and Betty, for joining us. And um, as Megan mentioned, now that we've all heard a bit about the work of the partnership and about the content underlying it, we are really thrilled to open a discussion with our panelists who have been driving this work. And so um, we just have a couple of discussion questions to start off the conversation, and we'll start with you, Pressler. Um, and we just would like to know, can you talk a little about your role in um, both in the Common Pay Department of Education and what has motivated the department to engage in this work um, and any kind of outcomes that you've seen so far or any kind of, um, you know, teacher feedback, principal feedback, just um, kind of give us the balcony view of, of the work and, and what you're seeing. Thank you, Kristen, and um, good morning, everyone. I'm Pressler, and I am with the Common Pay State Department of Education as the Chief of Curriculum and Instruction and Specialized Program. And I'll provide a little bit of a synopsis of the inception of the professional learning partnership with REL and also the impact that I'm seeing as, um, the impact that I'm seeing from the partnership that we have. So back in 2018, when the professional learning partnership one was in its uh, developmental stage with REL, we had to brainstorm to develop a meaningful, sustainable, high quality program, and also to determine how we could best benefit from this partnership. With the absence of professional learning within our system, we were primarily doing professional development. We focused on one day or two day training to our principals and teachers on selected areas of challenges and also based on the topics requests from the schools. With the professional learning partnership with REL, we were able to identify areas of need that we need to tackle. The content of our professional learning was finally put in place from the urgent need of our school principals, where we see that they are not comfortable and competent in providing constructive feedback to our teachers. Teachers have been hungry for constructive feedback, yet they are not receiving that much from the principals. Also from the school accreditation evaluation result, 
show that in Palm Bay statewide, the two weakest standards were teacher performance and data. Therefore, we tied our professional learning goals targeting principal to become influential instructional leaders by developing their standard competencies and improving their data decision-driven making. We've, conduct, we've conducted uh, through the partnership um, with uh, Mikan and Dr. Kent um, through a series of trainings such as um, using data to make instructional de decisions during learning communities, um, using data to plan professional development learning opportunities for our teachers, and using classroom walkthrough and observation data, and also learn how data can best support management decisions. These are some of just examples that I just shared along with what Natasha and uh, Mikan shared, and that is how we developed and went through the series. We also had like one week uh, principles academy where we covered like um, data all the way up to standard and kind of put tie everything back to accreditation since the work that the principals and the teachers are doing nowadays are primarily focused on the need of accreditation, which um, which has the ultimate goal is which um, work toward and closely addressing um, the target goal uh, and the ultimate goal of school accreditation in the FSM, which is to provide a inclusive learning environment uh, to the uh, school students. So some of the impacts that I saw from this training, um, our, our principals here in Bombay, they are more comfortable coaching and providing constructive feedback to um, on teachers lesson plan. With that, they were able to create um, learning communities at their school where teachers spent most of the time um, doing um, instructional planning. It has to be between grade, same grade level or throughout. And also one thing is um, that they were able to partner with uh, seasoned teachers um, at the schools with especially the new hires that we just hired, hired on board. Principals are more knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the curriculum that we are um, implementing here. And they were able to provide to see whether the, um, the student learning outcomes in this um, um, lesson plan objective and the activities and also the assessment, they are all aligned, as well as to provide reflection of the whole lesson plan where they looked at the lesson plan and see, oh, this lesson plan needs more time spending on instructional um, sequence or mo more time on differentiated activities. Um, one thing that I saw recently from our trainings was um, that Megan talked about was the, the modeling that Dr. Ken and Megan did in front of the principals, where they were able to see how they really plan together to develop a long, I mean, short-term lesson plan and how they sequence those lesson plans throughout the weeks. I think it's really an high opening experience because not only that we teach them what to do, but we also model. So that is the one more uh, most important thing that I, and valuable thing that I see that we model everything to the principals if we really want them to do a really good job. So from all the trainings and all the impacts of the partnership with REL, I am very comfortable that our principals are also um, competent and they love what they're doing. They kind of, they over what they're doing, they'll be, they were able to see the whole overall picture and not just a fraction of what they're doing. So um, these are some of the, the, uh, the insight that I can be able to share with you. And I'll reserve the rest uh, during the panel discussion. If you have any questions to ask, I'll, I'll be more than happy to um, provide you uh, from the observations and the collaborations that we had with the Brill and also our principals. Thank you so much, Pressler. Um, feel free, everyone, to add questions to the chat as we go along if you have any questions for Pressler. Um, and while we wait for those to come through, we're going to um, ask the same question of Betty. So, Betty, if you could introduce yourself a little bit about your work and the motivation of the partnership work with, um, with Rail Pacific and um, any outcomes you'd like to share, any highlights. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, uh, good morning to everyone. Um, but before I share some of the um, observations and insight from, from Coach Ice, and I'd like to first um, thank Real Pacific 
for organizing this webinar and having this panel uh, discussion. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to share some of the things that would be worth um, sharing out to um, other colleagues across the region. Um, and so Betty Segra, I serve as the administrator for the Division of Supplemental Support Services uh, for Kushai Department of Education. Um, and in my line of work, I work uh, primarily with the special education program, early child education program, um, as well as our workforce and workforce skills development program, uh, which embeds uh, PD, professional development or staff development for uh, Koshai DOE. Um, and, you know, one of the role that I serve is liaising between Rail Pacific and the Koshai Department of Education and the schools. Um, on the partnership projects uh, here in Koshai. And I would be echoing the same, um, same compliments that Presser has already uh, shared. Um, and a lot of similar experiences, um, observations, as Point Pesce DOE um, shared. Um, but when I first started on this project or, or joined this partnership, uh, they were about a year or so um, started already on the Principals Academy. And, you know, coming in um, and trying to understand what would be the basis, what would be the focus and purpose of the Principals Academy, I had to actually go and visit the schools and try and understand um, what is it that they need? What would they be gaining through a partnership with Rail Pacific? What would be meaningful for them? At the same time, looking at data from the central office, school FSM school accreditation evaluation results and reports, and identifying what areas still need improvement um, at the school level, at the principal or leadership level, as well as in teacher performance, like uh, Presser said. And I was surprised when during my visits, it would be one question I would ask the principals is, why are we seeing our schools at these levels in teacher performance somewhat low? Their response was simple, but very true. Was how can we train our teachers if we're not trained in well trained in the areas that they need improvement on? So when we first received Megan in Koshai for a coaching session with the principals, and I honestly am going to say it, we weren't sure what we wanted her to come and um, coach the principals and teachers on. And we just said, let's, let's try classroom management. But an activity that she did in that session really stood out and sort of became, became, became the basis, became um, the example that our principals are using these days. Model. She modeled. She modeled. Um, it's that they train, you have to know what to, uh, how to do things before you teach others to learn how to do it. And she modeled that in an activity, you know, uh, very well and that, and that stuck with our principals. Um, and that has, that's one of the things that the teachers have been um, doing, practicing. Now, there's a lot of things that came out of uh, the Principals Academy for the principals in Koshai. Um, and Megan, thank you, Megan and Natasha for um, outlining that in your, in your uh, PowerPoints, in your presentations, um, the components, what's integral um, at the national level, at the district or uh, state level, the accreditations, and then down to the school community level, the school improvement plans, and then even to the classroom level, instructional strategies, um, and all these drive drive uh, what what these principals and teachers try and find get professional learning on. Um, however, like like Professor shared, through these school accreditation evaluations, 
Um, we are able to identify the areas of need for improvement, including data management, data collection, um, data analysis, and more importantly, data interpretation. What, what is it telling them? How do they understand this? What does it mean? What do they have to work on? And that's, those are some of the components of, of the series of trainings or coaching sessions that Koshai has received with the Principals Academy and have been very, very useful in helping not just at the Koshai DOE Central office, but also at the school level, planning and designing professional learning um, communities, professional learning calendars, setting up these professional learning calendars to become more sustainable rather than holding these ad hoc. And that's what's been happening for so long, uh, for so many years, doing one thing at a time and just not doing any follow-up. But having had this opportunity to start from one day, connecting each and every component that is integral to the outcome of student learning, it's making, it, it's helping our um, school leadership especially at this point, our school principal better understand, better, better understand not just the hierarchy of what the education mandates, uh, what the education policies um, or regulations um, are and how it's supposed to be implemented, but even deeper understanding of how, how their work at the school level is aligned to these broader goals. This overarching goal of ensuring that there's equitable and quality teaching and learning in our schools. And I think this is one of the, this would be one of the underlining um, attributes that really make this partnerships in FSM uh, with Rail Pacific meaningful. It's having that mutual have that mutual interest, have that mutual commitment in making sure that there is that capacity here in FSM, in Koshai, uh, for our principals, our school principals, or our, even our education leaders to be able to do just that, designing um, and implementing quality professional learning that would in end, hopefully, bringing out more learning, better learning for our school children. Um, there's so much that I'd like to share, but being um, considerate of the time, I am gonna stop here and stand by for any questions and we'd be happy to share more examples if, if um, any is, is requested. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Betty. I, we're continuing to have some technical difficulties, not just with the rename setting, but with the chat features. So Canela, um, I did send you, shoot you a direct message to see if that's something that you can re-enable. Uh, I tried to re-enable that feature as host or as co-host rather. Okay, so it looks like it works. Excellent. Thank you, Greg, for letting us know. So um, the remaining two people who came in as Kirsten Miller should also, I think at this point, be able to rename themselves. So um, if anyone wants to ask a question, please feel free to add that to the chat. Um, we did have a comment earlier on, um, also that we'll get to, um, but here's one question. Uh, were principals instructed to apply a specific change theory or model to help their teachers when introducing new learning strategies? And I'll open that up to anyone in the group who, um, who is interested in answering that, Egan um, and Tasha included, Presser and, and Betty. Well, thank you very much um, for the question. Um, the question was whether were principals instructed to apply specific change theory? Not necessarily. Um, our focus is more on getting to um, getting the principals to really understand for uh, to become instructional leaders because that's one of the weaknesses that I see as a chief of curriculum and instruction. So when we visit the schools, um, I noticed that there is a great need of uh, professional development or learning around. Um, Curriculum, is, curriculum and instruction. Um, just to give you a brief information that our principals um, due to um, 
either um, through the hiring process that some of our teachers are not education major or education related nature. So there's a lot of professional development that we have to support, provide to support the teachers and principals on the ground. So what we're really um, training them on what to do right now is basically to follow the, the, the lesson plan that we provide to them with the basic guide that we have created for them. It's really um, detailed layout and detail oriented. However, they still need to unpack some of the long terms and also short terms to really see a great picture of what they wanted to teach. So um, we did not um, tell them to change other things, but as they see that the fit and the needs of their teachers, that's what they really bring in. And also we help them develop that professional learning around those areas of challenges that they are facing, currently facing at the schools. And then Betty, did you want to weigh in on that as well? Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, and thank you, um, Pressler. Um, similar, similar to the case in Point Bay, um, while we were while we we're rolling out this Principals Academy and providing these um, instructional or these trainings for them, um, we do not require them um, to do it using any required uh, change of theory, uh, methodology or approach. However, we highly encourage these principals to really utilize their data to look at the state assessments, the state assessment uh, reports, um, look at the school accreditation uh, reports and see where their performances are in the low and um, where it continues to be stagnant. And try to really think about if they were, if they could change one thing and try and see a change in one area at least, what, what would they tweak? How would they tweak things in, in how they do instructional um, classroom instructions and, and even leadership uh, practices in their schools? So yes, um, there's no, no required um, requirement to the principals to follow a certain uh, change of theory uh, method, but encourage them to see what would make sense to them and what would uh, have meaning to the changes that they, they uh, employ. Thank you, Betty. So it looks like this is Kendi from the University of Hawaii who's asking about what kind of compensation, if any, teachers received for participating in communities of learning and whether teachers and staff participate in the accreditation process. Well, um, as for now, there is, um, they, they, it's part of their professional um, log sheet that they have to attend several professional trainings um, to um, help them help their teaching practices um, in the classroom. Um, we do have incentive program at the end of the fiscal, uh, at the end of school year where uh, if teachers are performing exemplary um, according to our um, evaluation, then we have monetary awards that we incentive that we give, it, give out um, at the end of the school year. In terms of accreditation, it's the FSM um, accreditation system. It's not a WASC. Um, teachers are very involved in the accreditation process where they, they were part of um, the data collection. Uh, at, well, at the schools, the principal and also the teachers, they collaborated a lot in uh, the preparation of this process where um, they group themselves into standards. There are six standards and they have to make sure that each one of them is placed in one of the standards and be responsible. So if they're responsible of, let's say, a teacher standard, they're the ones that will be calling out meetings, making plans, um, and to uh, inform the whole school to be part of. And like the other uh, standards that there, um, that there are, um, principal standards, uh, leadership standards, school improvement standard, curriculum standard, or school facilities, they are all placed in these groups. And when it comes to the accreditation, they have part in that where they prepare the, um, evidences that would speak directly to some of the criteria that are under each of these standards. So they are very much involved in the uh, accreditation process.
Thank you, Professor. Betty, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, maybe I have a couple of additional questions um, that I, I want to uh, try to be mindful of everybody's time and, um, and get to those as well. Okay. You can go ahead um, with the other questions. Okay, so there was a question from Michelle about the conclusions reported on slide 38. Um, and those were around best practices for professional, for developing professional learning. So those are things like 15 hours on each topic, ensure that sessions are well organized, purposefully developed, implementation of research based practices. Um, and Megan and Tasha, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but um, those were those particular points were the result of a fairly extensive lit review that we conducted prior to um, proposing this work through the U.S. Department of Ed, and then um, we have um, we've continued to review research along the way to ensure that we're using best practices and research-based um, evidence as as we work together with this partnership. Um, I'm happy to share. We will share the, the PowerPoint um, as a PDF um, in the next day or so. And all of those references are in there if you would like to um, take a closer look at that. And we're happy to answer any additional questions on specific references uh, going forward. And can I just add, Kirsten, that those are very boiled down from the actual session that talked about um, best practices. So thank you. So let's see what else we have. Um, so Roberta is asking if this is a local accreditation or associated with the national accreditation. I think I already responded to that. Um, it is the FSM, it is our local accreditation system. So we, we have about four minutes left here. So if anyone has any additional um, questions, please do feel free to put them in the chat. I'm also going to add our survey link. Um, this is just a very quick survey, just a few questions um, to let us know how we did. We, we very much appreciate you um, sticking with us through the, um, the technical issues that we, we some, some new issues to us, some I've never seen before and some that, uh, that we're a little more familiar, but we do appreciate you sticking with us through those. Um, so I'm just adding the, um, the survey link there. If um, you're able to just take a few minutes to just let us know um, what you thought of the content today, if there's anything else that you'd like to see in future Well Pacific webinars. Um, um, and we'll send this out in um, an email as well. Um, I have, we have one more question here. Uh, for your school district, do you normally deliver professional development, professional learning and coaching to your school leaders and teachers in the vernacular? And do teachers deliver their instruction to students in their native tongue as well? That's a great question. That is a really good question. And I thank you for that question. Um, where, when there is a need for um, conducting this training in vernacular in Bombayan, we have to do it in Bombayan. Otherwise, if we do have uh, expat teachers that are in the in the pool we have to use english but most of the time we also code switch um we we switch between the two languages and also in the question regarding if the teachers deliver the instruction to the students in their native tongue as well yes they do especially during the lower grades all the way up to fifth grade and even at the high school when there is a need they require the language of instruction is english but if there is a need um, for them to explain that in Pompeian to make it really clear to the students they can always um, use Pompeian but uh, right after that they the students get the crash the topic or whatever the instruction is they all they go back to teaching um teaching the students in English but yeah it's back and forth it's a mix of um two languages Pompeian and English Any other questions? Betty, did you want to weigh in on that as well? Thank you. Just real quick, um, you know, it is the same in Koshar, like uh, Presta shared. Um, professional learning trainings are are usually usually conducted in English um, uh, in the vernacular language. However, when there's more technical um, concepts to explain, and and also when we have our um, technical consultants um, from off island joining us for these coaching sessions. We utilize English as well, uh, but also do code switching or translanguaging. 
Um, but I just wanted to share that and on the latter question, do teachers deliver their instruction to the students in the native tongue as well? Um, similar to Pompeii, the early grades, um, um, mostly in the local vernacular. Um, however, I wanted to share that just this school year, uh, the start of the school year, Koshai uh, launched its uh, pilot project for bilingual instruction based on a bilingual instruction language of instruction model requiring um, the use of both languages, but at different ratios at different grade levels. Um, and that is something that we're really working hard on um, at the moment, trying to um, train and help our teachers uh, be able to provide that instruction per the ratios um, required under this language policy. Um, so it's, it's uh, ratioed out as requiring 90% uh, for in vernacular, 10% um, uh, 90 in 10% in vernacular, 10 in English or the second language, and then and then goes up for, um, first and second grade, um, 80, 20, going up to 50, 50 at grade five, leveled off all the way through uh, grade 12. But this is something that's um, pretty new to a lot of our teachers and a lot of our schools, um, really trying to provide instruction in um, the second language, which would be English for us um, here in Koshai. And, and it's something that, you know, we're still having challenges, but we're working hard on. Um, so it's something that we would also welcome any, any um, help or ideas, suggestions on how to um, help our teachers with this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Can I just add on? So um, currently what the current practice right now is, to, is that from grade ECE or kindergarten all the way up to third grade, everything has to be taught in vernacular. And then they switch, start the shift, uh, uh, switching from um, Bombay into English from grade four all the way up to grade 12. So um, we're in the process of finalizing our um, language policy where um, language of instruction will be all the way up to um, eighth grade. I mean, Bombayan in some of the subject areas. But in the meantime, there is a specific time for English and also Bombayan. So there is a specific slot that is allotted for learning Bombayan language and Bombayan culture, and as well as the instruction will be fully in English for some of the subjects. So that's how it's, um, and one of the challenges that we're facing uh, right now is that we do have five outer islands that speak different languages. So um, if we have to teach them, if the policy will say that they have to teach them in their mother tongue, then that is another, you know, things that we need to also consider because um, it has to be done in their own uh, mother tongue. Uh, the instructions, uh, especially from grade EC all the way up to fourth grade. And um, that is one of the things that we're looking at that, you know, will be a little bit challenging in terms of uh, resources for now. Thank you, Professor. We do have a few more questions. So anyone who's able to stay on, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to get through these as much as we can. And then maybe um, we can also follow up in an email to participants with um, some additional information. But Greg had um, noted that he was interested in the degree of self-directed learning practices promoted in both students and staff. It's really not that much for our um, students. Um, for the students right now, one of the things self-directed program that we have, I'd say, is the um, the be able where they are um, they have their own internet access code where they log on to the computer and do their extra work, um, supplemental work along with you know, what is required for them to do. Um, for teachers, um, it's pretty much you know, the professional learnings that are currently happening at their schools where they have a lot of times specifically um, reserved for uh, collaboration and instructional planning or um, other things, uh, trainings that you know, might you know, be created um, just because of classroom observation, both formal and informal. Thank you. Thank you, Kessler. Um, so we do have we do have a number of other um, comments. There's there's a question 
asking whether there's a mandate requiring teachers to teach in vernacular to their students and what student data show uh, regarding the first language of um, their students. I know that that's a big topic and I, I think we probably um, won't have time to get too much into it, but I wonder if you could speak to the the um, language of instruction question, whether there, there is a mandate um, requiring teachers to teach in vernacular. The mandate is the language policy for now. So whatever the language policy, once it's, well, in, in the case of Koshai, they already have the language policy in place. We're finalizing our language policy. So whatever um, going to be the language of instruction for specific grade level in several subject areas, then that's going to be the language of instruction. It's either in Bombayan or in English. Thank you. And, and from Koshai, yes, the Koshai education language policy, um, you know, is not just focusing on enriching um, English language um, for non-English uh, speaking learners, um, but also to be very, very uh, mindful in also preserving in, uh, the vernacular language. So it's it's promoting both languages uh, without without um, losing one or the other. Thank you, Betty and Kressler. Um, lots of comments in the chat, um, particularly around um, how useful it is to kind of hear what this looks like on the ground and how this partnership has played out. So we so appreciate you joining us. Um, to discuss that, as always, um, and you know, I think we'll um, we will be mindful of time and um, go ahead and wrap this up. Again, um, we'll send a follow up email. You can absolutely respond to that with any additional questions for our presenters, and we'll get back to you on that. We'll also send out the slide deck and the survey link as well. Um, if there there are no additional questions, um, then I think. Well, there's, we have one additional question. Um, I think that's more actually for the Real Pacific team around the language experts um, who um, can train indigenous teachers in teaching second language acquisition. We, um, we do have some resources that we can share about that. So we um, can definitely provide um, some Real Pacific resources that may be helpful, which we can also share in our follow-up. Um, but I think we're going to go ahead and close out. And thank you again, Betty and Pressler, for joining us today, Megan and Natasha, for your presentation, and all of our participants for joining us. <laughs>